Buenos dias. Good morning. I'm State Representative Lisa Hernandez. I uh, represent the 24th District, and that will uh, that encompasses a, a bit of the city, which is Little Village, Sister Ober. When I go all the way as far as Brookfield, yay! Yes, of course. So I, I think it's always important to. Um, really kind of let you know the areas that we, we represent. I've been in office for uh, 14 years, uh, one of the most senior Latino members in the House. And so um, we have, I want to say we have a fantastic program, really hoping that you will enjoy it. So welcome all. Thank you, yes. It's our, yes. So it's our 17th annual Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation Conference. Um, so I, I already told you who I am. So I'm also the co-chair of the foundation, along I share it with uh, Senator Omar Aquino. We are, thank you. We are delighted that you chose to attend the ILLCF has planned an exciting and informative conference, and by the end of the day, I know you will agree that you learned a lot, helped celebrate Latino achievements, and are energized to work toward even more success for Illinois Latino community in the future. It was a great success this past session, and we're looking for more. We have chosen for this year's name a new framework for equity. With the new administration and with our successful legislative session last spring, our community has high expectations for access to new programs, equitable distribution of resources throughout the state, and in general, greater involvement in the legislative process at every level of government be it the city, be it the county, or the state. I also want to mention that CAN TV uh, will be covering today's proceedings. This coverage will be broadcast later, so please check your local listing and uh, our website for first broadcast times and channels. Also, I want you to know that I want to acknowledge uh, the tremendous support that we have received by the news media. Thank you very much for that. It, whether it was by television, radio, and newsprint for their extraordinary advertising efforts preceding the, the conference. We have several exhibitors. Have you seen the exhibit tables? There's some fun stuff out there. Please, please, please take a look at them, engage. It's very important that you do that. I believe we got about close to 80 exhibitors. Um, so um, please support them. Um, they are truly supporting us. And uh, so we encourage you to uh, take a look at them. As time permits to visit their um, tables, uh, and I think there's also where you can take, a, there, there's a, a camera where you can take little of these, um, their, their uh, recordings. Um, please take advantage of that. That's gonna be helpful for our, our census segment. Um, well, okay, so I hope you have a great time. I know that you'll, you're gonna enjoy the, the program. At this time, I'm going to call to the podium our I, uh, our foundation member, Ira uh, Supervera, could you come up, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Ida? Okay, Ida. <laughs> Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you are ready to be inspired today, and I mean that truly. Uh, you see, 11 years ago, I attended this conference and was inspired to run for office as the first Latina in my hometown of Hanover Park. I attended a, for a panel discussion, and there was a woman there 
a woman mayor, and she talked about women running for office and how sometimes as women we have a list of reasons as to why we think we can't do it. And in that moment, I recognized, oh, I'm doing that. And I didn't want to be that woman. And that was the moment that I decided to run for office. I was elected the following year, and at the age of 23, I became the youngest elected official in the state of Illinois at that time. Thank you. This year, I'm celebrating 10 years elected because I was inspired here, here at this conference. We will kick off today being inspired by Rick Nahida. He's a trailblazer in Hollywood. Like many of us, the road behind him is on fire. He's got a long list. He's an actor, comedian, director, producer, and writer with an expansive list of credits. But I'd like to give special mention to three particular accomplishments. He was the screenwriter of Nothing Like the Holidays, which was filmed here in Chicago, and exposed in the big screen our local treasure of the Humble Park neighborhood. He is one of three Latinos that has written and starred in his own Broadway show, Latino Logs. And most importantly, just like me, he is a proud descendant of Chihuahua, Mexico. Woohoo! Hey, I hear some Chihuahua out there. Please help me in welcoming Rick Nahira. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, when I, when I hear people introduce me on stage, um, I sound really cool. And uh, it feels good for a second. Then I realized the expectation now is a lot higher if I had been introduced differently. So I want to tell my story. Um, my story, the reason I'm choosing my story, first of all, is because a lot of people ask me, how did you do it? How do you do it? And it's really a simple answer. You work. You work really hard. You work all the time. You never stop working. And you never let anything ever stop you from achieving your dream. With Latinos, we don't work for ourselves. It's a hard concept for us to understand. A lot of times, we work for our family. We always work for other people because we care about other people. If we're successful, we do not enjoy that success if we don't have the success of all our community with us. That's the way we think, that not one can be successful, but all must become su successful. A, a lot of times when I started out, you know, my wife told me when, before I came to Chicago, please don't be controversial. So I said, this is a nonpartisan organization, I'm gonna be non-controversial, but I will tell my story. My story was started out as a kid was, I was five children, Mexican kids in one bedroom in a little place in, called La Mesa. La Mesa is the name of the city I came from. La Mesa is a very, means the table, basically. I don't know how the Spanish monks gave us such boring names. La Mesa, Spring Valley, Chula Vista, pretty view, all these different things. So I grew up in La Mesa and my family was from Barrio Logan, a typical barrio. My grandfather is a big, tall huero from Chihuahua and that's where I get my huero from, blue eyes, tall. <laughs> Hueros, for the Anglos who don't know what that means, it means tall, good-looking Latino male. <laughs> so it's not me who calls me this, my people, huero. So when you hear huero, it just means tall, good-looking Latino male. My grandmother, of course, very dark, indígena, indigenous. You know, her thing was, she was, when my grandfather bought our place in Logan Heights, this is history, because if you know your history, you'll be able to tell your story. When he bought the house in Logan Heights, he came there, a big, tall, wet old man with blue eyes, and they sold it to him. And then when the person saw a family, his family coming with my grandmother, who was dark, and all the other children who were much darker, he said, are you Mexican? And he said, yes, I am. He goes, well, I wouldn't have sold you this house if I knew you were Mexican. He said, well, it's too late now. <laughs> he always had a great attitude. He was a big man. He, he raised fighting cocks. He just was a baker. He was, he was a typical macho from, uh, from Norteño. And so here he was buying this place in Logan Heights. And my grandmother and all the kids were moving, and we started growing Logan Heights up. The joke is, that Logan Heights used to be a very boring, middle-class white neighborhood till we came in. We brought in cockfighting, loud picnics and parties and mariachis and music and all that. We gave it culture, uh, and the white people left. So, 
That's what happened. But my grandma uh, had a son, Eduardo Nakeda, my father. My father served in World War II, and he also served in Vietnam. Now you think about that. As Latinos, we were in World War II and in Vietnam. And I've had cousins in Iraq. I lost an uncle in World War II. You know, another part of my, my story is my mother. My mother was from Boone, Iowa. That's right, Boone, Iowa. People are always surprised. I go, I'm from the Midwest. I grew up on, on ambrosia salad, string beans, ham, all wrapped in a flour tortilla. That was the difference. <laughs> but I grew up with my, my mother being from Boone, Iowa. She was very good, and she taught me, you know, Rick, be nice. It was a big thing. Every day I'd walk on stage and be nice, and I would go to the banquets like this, and I'd look at it out, and I would see a banquet waitress serving every person there, and that was my mother. That's how she made her living. She was a worker at uh, Town & Country in San Diego, a banquet waitress. She would bring me home food. I remember getting smoked oysters as a child, which is really bad for you. <laughs> and also, I, I looked like Louis XV. I uh, was like, I was, had gout. I mean, they were giving me everything that no kid should ever get because we survived off leftovers, that's the truth. And all these five kids in this, this little house in La Mesa, we were the only Mexicans, and there was another group of Mexicans next to us, and they lived on a chicken ranch. They lived on a chicken ranch. The other group of Mexicans lived up the street, and the one girl was very studious, and, and the little guy down in the chicken ranch, he would always come and, and hang out with me, and we'd go play, and my mother would tell me, and this is where my first joke came from. I told my mother, I'm gonna go play with Juan down at the chicken ranch. I'm gonna go play with the Mexicans. And she looked at me and she said, you are Mexican, you can stay home and play with yourself. <laughs> That's where my first joke came from. <laughs> I created a show called Latin's Anonymous and all it started with, you would go, uh, hi, I, I, I'm Rick, I admit I'm a Latino. They'd say, we'll try it, hi Rick. <laughs> and I admit I'm a Latino. The first time I realized I was Latino, I was nine years old. I told my mom I was going to play with the kids down the street, the Mexican kids. She said, you are Mexican, so you can go home and play with yourself. But I got bored with that and was worried about going blind. That was my second joke. <laughs> yes, inappropriate. What can I say in this odd world? Comedians, we can be inappropriate. It's wrong for politicians to tell jokes, trust me. <laughs> We're the professionals. We're supposed to tell the jokes. We're supposed to be in trouble. We're supposed to step over the line. Politicians, don't tell jokes. You don't know you're telling a joke or not. You gotta be true to who you are. So there I was, you know, living in La Mesa, all that stuff, these kids down here. And I went to the schoolyard and I remember this and I, I tell this story and I've told it many times because it's true. I go to the schoolyard and there's a kid there and he's, he, was, uh, he saw me and I was playing with the, a ball against the wall. I was playing a, like handball, very Mexican. And uh, he comes up to me, grabs the ball and he says, that's my ball. I said, no, it's, it's my ball. And he goes, no, that's my ball. And I go, no, it's my ball. And he goes, no, it's my ball. And he pushes me on the ground. And he says, well, it's my ball now, wet back. And I'd never heard the term before. It didn't sound like a bad word, dry back, quarterback, half back, wet back. <laughs> but just to play it safe, I kick his ass. So <laughs> it was a little Oscar de la Hoya moment for me. So I did a really good job. My family were all boxers. I, I knew it a box. It wasn't gonna take long. And there he is crying, and the teacher runs up to me. She goes, why'd you hurt Bradley? Why is Bradley crying? Why is Bradley crying? And I said, because he called me a wetback. And she looks down at me, wetter that I am, and she goes, are you Mexican? <laughs> I've never denied it. I said, yes, I'm Mexican, very proudly. And she said, well, then you are a wetback. She meant it sincerely. For her, that was the word for Mexican, not understanding why I did that. But when you hear that story, you can hear the story, and you, you can see the, the pain behind that. And there is pain. We have to acknowledge when, when we, uh, we are, are, have are victims of racism, and I've seen it more and more, we have to acknowledge our feelings. We have to say, that hurt. That's wrong. We have to speak up every single chance we get. And don't ever let anyone tell you not to speak up, especially now in America. You need to speak up and tell your story. So I put that story in a play, Latin's Anonymous. And that story got tons of laughter. And I took something that was tragic and I made it funny. And that was the, the whole thing, doing it that way. You know, and I thought about it, I went to my friend's house at that time, it was Nicky Witt, he was a little, little kid, very white. He was almost translucent, you could see his veins, it was weird. <laughs> Amazing, so there he was, and, and I go, went there every Friday and they'd bring a, they have a lazy Susan. 
You know, I'd never seen such inventions as Lazy Susan being a Mexican kid. I mean, we have nothing but lazy about our people at all. <laughs> so, so Lazy Susan was amazing. You did, and they made tacos. It was, it was cheddar cheese, you know, salsa to them was just cut up tomatoes. Uh, it was, you know, some sort of weird ketchup-y sauce or things like that. The worst tacos I've ever had in my life. And I would ch chomp on these tacos and have them with them. And, and finally, I, I look at them, and after five weeks of tacos every Friday night, I said, Nikki, your family loves tacos. And he said, we don't love tacos. We thought you'd be more comfortable having tacos. <laughs> Now here's the beautiful part of this. I thought about it, and I could have got angry and said, how ignorant of you, and stood there in a woke rage, how dare you, I'm taking my bad taco and leaving right now. <laughs> and I said, here what they're doing is they want to make me feel at home so badly, as ignorant as they are, they love me. As ignorant as they are, they brought me in their world. As ignorant as they are, they've included me. So a lot of times I'll tell people, as a comedian, as someone who works in this business, who does this stuff, it's just about educating people to tell them who you are. It's sometimes taking a moment, listening to what they say, and go, you know something? You're totally wrong, um, but let's talk about it. We all want to be understood. Every one of us wants to be understood. Every one of us wants to be respected. Every one of us wants the same thing. We have to see the same things. Growing up in San Diego, I grew up on the border. I grew up on the border of Mexico and California. I could actually, as Sarah Palin says, she could see Russia. I could literally see Tijuana. I literally could see a big Mexican flag. And when you grow up in San Diego in the more, at night, they lull you to sleep with the Mexican national anthem. They actually do that because the transmitters for uh, the shows are in Tijuana. So they have to show the Mexican national anthem. So every, every night, as the show would end, I'd hear da 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 And I would go, I live in this world, a world filled with so many contradictions and uniqueness, having a mother from, from Boone, Iowa, that's Mexican. Another thing about my mother, she had a, a brother. His name was Joe Ubaye, Joe Ubaye. And they captured him. In, uh, during World War II, and they made him march the March of Bataan, and he ended up in a UFO, uh, um, POW camp. And in the POW camp, as he's about to be reunited with his family, they sent a, a telegram to my grandmother and said, Joe is coming back. And uh, they killed him. They put him in a pit, they shot him, and it was a horrible tragedy. Joe Baye. So my mother would tell me that story. And I always remember it and see the pain in her eyes. And I thought, we're part of World War II. Why don't we see that in movies? Why don't we see ourselves and our stories told in movies? We're in World War II. My father went through World War II. And then he came back, and then eventually he went to Vietnam. As a child, I remember, he went to Vietnam. And one day he told me, I said, Dad, why'd you go to Vietnam? He said, oh, the overtime. I said, what? The overtime. You got good overtime if you went to Vietnam. And it was during the Tet Offensive. I said, you went there during the Tet Offensive for overtime? He goes, yeah, lots of overtime. We did really well. Now, that's a Mexican work ethic. <laughs> if you go on out to Vietnam for overtime, you're definitely a Mexican. <laughs> we will go anywhere for a job. We will work any job it takes. We will do it to feed our families. I see the immigrants coming on up here to America, making our country great. And I see the sacrifices they do, and I realize what they've done for our people. And I see that. We are all here because of someone else. Every student here is getting a scholarship, and I'm proud of you all. I'm proud of you all, because the truth is, when I look at the world and I see the world as it is, and we wake up every day in this world where we hear Latinos being attacked, uh, recently, I saw it. I was in, I was in uh, Encino. My wife pull, pulls up in a car to my house, and she goes, Rick, get in, get again, get in, get in. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? She goes, get in. So I get in the car, and uh, she takes me down the street, and she goes, there's this woman being yelled at by another woman, and she's following her in her car. So I go down the street, and I see this woman driving a car, following a little brown woman, you know, so I'm assuming she's Mexican, and she's yelling, you don't belong in this country. You don't belong here. 
get out of my country, get out of my country, you don't belong here. Screaming, following her in a car, and this woman is crying. I get in my car and I see her and I, I stand in front of her car. My wife joins me, we stand in front to stop that car following this woman. And another group of people co go, drives up and they, they start, shield the woman as well. It was two Jews from Encino, and a Mexican, and my wife, she's, she's Anglo, protecting this woman. And you know what? She wasn't even Latina. She was Armenian. <laughs> That's what ignorance is. You put the prejudice on the wrong people. She was Armenian. I talked to her and I said, do you want to get in the car? We'll drive you wherever you want to go. And she said, no, I'm okay. And then the Jewish couple said the same thing. And she said, all right, please, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> Which tells you a little something about her. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm a scary looking guy, I don't know. But so she goes away. And that's, I reported to the police, I called the police. You know, we're gonna report this hate crime, let's get involved, we gotta catch this woman, all this stuff. Police turn to me and go, this happens all the time. There's nothing you can do. Think about that. I think about my, my, my grandmother, my uncle Joe Ovalle, and I think, think of situations like that and I realize how that we're forgetting our potential we're forgetting what we bring to the table. Latinos are not uninvited guests at a wedding, holding presents, wondering, maybe I should go, maybe I should go in, maybe that table's for me, I'm not sure. You belong. This is your country. This is your land. You fought for it. You earned it. All that is yours, and you have to remember it. So when I tell my story, I can't tell my story without remembering the people around me. And I see that. And coming to events like this in Chicago, even coming here, I was working. I was working, I was writing, because I'm in school. I'm going back to school, I'm going back to Cal Lutheran. I go to school, and, and I got a, a teacher complaining to me, saying, you need this uh, essay in. And I'm like, I'm going to speak. I'm doing some really important things. That essay needs to be in today, or would you take 10% of your grade away? <laughs> they really don't care. <laughs> They're teachers. So now I talk to my children, I relate to them and say, oh, these teachers are tough, man. They're tough. Oh, they're expecting me to learn all the time. And I tell my kids, I go, here's a simple thing about if you want to be successful, don't say I have to go to school. Say I get to go to school. Say I get to go to school. I get to go to school. I get to come here. I get to talk to you. I get to meet new people. I get to meet people that are similar to me. A lot of times when people hear my, my, my story and it sounds pretty good and my wife's a publicist so she <laughs> makes sure the bio looks right and all those thousand things. And I realize I'm not special. I'm ordinary. All of us are ordinary to do extraordinary things. Think about your grandparents. Think about your parents. My parents had no education, high school at best. My grandfather had a fourth grade education. I'm in college. My children go to one of the best schools in LA. They will, they actually think about going to college. And I used to think the first time I ever met a Latino teacher was two years ago. Two years ago in college, I had a Chicano studies teacher. And he was Chicano for sure. I mean, he would be like, hey, what's up? We're gonna do this thing. I'm going to give you a lecture now. So what's happening is, this is 1851, you know, it's really tough on us Chicanos, you know what I'm saying? It was bad. <laughs> totally bad, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, this is a homeboy, man. <laughs> I, I never felt so, you know, so un-Mexican in my life. <laughs> this guy was like talking this way, he wore his khakis, looking at me, look at you. And I remember, I, I mean, I, I got accepted to USC. They didn't give me a scholarship. I didn't go. I didn't have a parent buying my way in. I couldn't join the road team. <laughs> Wish I had, <laughs> by any means necessary, rich people. <laughs> you like to get in. But so, um, he was my, I went to Chicano's uh, group and I couldn't get in. My father sat there and said, you can't go to USC. The way, he goes, I could never afford that money. It was all, it was too much for him. I saw him outside writing a note, asking for money. I'd never seen my father ever ask for anything. The first time he ever asked for something was for his child. That's what a parent does. We will do anything for our children. We really will, and I hope you guys remember that about your parents. You know, so I went to a Chicano group, 
they looked at me and I said, hey, I really need a scholarship. My dad said, go to the Mecha. And Mecha is like, Momento Azul de Chicano de Aslan. Real Chicano. I go in there and he goes, look at you, oh, güero. Don't speak Spanish all that good. I'm like, you don't speak Spanish all that good either. <laughs> he goes, we're looking at me like that, you know. I don't know if we can support you. Look at you, oh, güero, not speaking Spanish. I go, well, 10% of Mexico doesn't speak Spanish. They only speak indigenous languages. Consider me one of them. <laughs> I wasn't doing any, any, myself a favor with all my arguments back. And I didn't get that scholarship. But you know something? I had to go and start to write. And I began to write. And I didn't go to USC. I got to talk at USC. I got to talk at Harvard. I got to talk at all these great places. And I said, I'm going to go back to school. I want to put education first in my life and I'm gonna to go to school. So right now, I am maybe applauded, but I'm gonna be a student with a 10% a, a lower grade if I don't get the essay in. <laughs> and last night, I was writing the essay till like two in the morning and stuff like that. And I said, oh, I'm being a Mexican. I'm working really hard. I'm working hard not just for anyone but myself, but my family. I'm working hard for my children. I'm doing what us Latinos do. We work hard for others. And that's a great thing. When I got to, to Hollywood, I, I went out for a show called In Living Color. In Living Color, and I remember, here it was in San Diego, I got a chance, my first opportunity came from Second City of Chicago. They came to San Diego to shoot a special and they looked for two unknown actors. They searched all San Diego and I was an actor at the Old Globe Theater and you know, very well, no one even knew I was Mexican. Later on, they found out, and that's another story. But there I was. And so I met a woman, she was an African-American woman, single mother, kid, very tough for her working there. And she says, Rick, it's Second City, you walk in and you do improv. And I said, okay, what's improv? I've never done improv. I've learned lines, I've never done improv. She goes, just say yes. Just say yes. This is a very important lesson for you students and for other people to say yes. So I went to the Second City Improv and they looked at me and they said, uh, do you know improv? Yes, I do. <laughs> would you like to do improv? Yes, I would. <laughs> Look, there's a big ship. Yes, there is. <laughs> it's the biggest ship we've ever seen. Yes, it is the biggest ship we've ever seen. Oh my God, what's gonna happen to us? And I did this whole improv and they gave me the job. The woman was Whoopi Goldberg. She was the woman. She told me, and there's gonna be people that come into your lives who'll give you lessons and will put you in different directions. Be open to those people. Just as you were inspired 11 years ago, look where you are now in politics. There's gonna be people around you. Whoopi Goldberg was one of those people. When I started thinking about writing, you know, after Second City, I went to Hollywood, and my neighbor said, you should write. And I said, oh, I'm not a writer, I'm an actor. He says, no, you, you write really well, you should write. And I go, oh, I'm not a writer. So I finally I wrote a play, and the play did well, well, and I got residuals and all this uh, royalties, and I went to this mailbox with him, and he got my royalty, and I said, look, I got a royalty from, from Canada. I'm an international playwright. And I showed him my $657 proudly, and he said, oh, I got a, a residual check. And he brought out his green residual check for the Writers Guild. It's green, which means money, so it's always a happy sign if you see it in the, your mailbox. He pulls it out and he reads, oh, $36,000. <laughs> and I said, I want to be in your business. <laughs> that man was John Wells. He was the president of the WGA. He wrote, he wrote West Wing, all these great shows. It took John Wells and Whoopi Goldberg to even get me to think about being a writer. And I say to you, there's going to be people in your life that are going to come in there and will do things about saying, you got your degree now? Why not get a master's? Why not get a PhD? Why not be teaching in a school? Because you know what Latinos need? We need to see ourselves teaching us. <laughs> we need to see ourselves teaching us. And just like that Chicano professor inspired me, I started writing, and I started writing stories that were historical about Chicanos and Latinos and our people. I wrote just recently a project for Mario Lopez about our people. He likes it, and you know the beautiful thing is, when you have Latinos in charge, we can recognize things other people can't. A lot of times I would go into meetings and they would say, Rick, Rick, tell us about the pain of the barrio. <laughs> Come here, you little brown cupcake, I wanna hug you. <laughs> 
tell us about the pain of the barrio. So I always had a problem because I could never tell the pain of the barrio. And I said, because there was no pain in the barrio for me. It was a great place. It was my grandparents, my grandfather. It was a wonderful place. It wasn't painful. It was wonderful. It was home. I said, the pain is when you leave the barrio. The pain is when you leave your community. The pain is what so many students feel when they go away to school. And they're wondering if this is worth it because our values are about family. It's hard for a family to break up to get an education, to go away to New York or places like that and not see their family because our family is our life. You know, recently with the whole family separations, it just tears me up. And I see that because what is the worst thing you can do to a Latino? The worst thing you can do to a Latino. You can't, you can't work us to death. You can't be prejudiced and racist against us to stop us from coming here. You can't do any of that. What you can do is take away our families. That's the most terrifying thing. And I look at that and I see us here today as family. I see what you are doing and I see what you're doing to strengthen your community. Chicago is a great place. It's one of my favorite cities ever to write about. You know why? It's a great combination. Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, together in Humboldt Park, together in Pilsen, together. And I gotta tell you, we're very different people. <laughs> We have Mexicans, we, uh, we joke about it. Sometimes we can be angry. Sometimes we can, we call it Mexican Alzheimer's. They forget everything but a grudge. <laughs> Puerto Ricans, they'll get really angry and all of a sudden the next day, ay papi, come here. <laughs> ay bendito. <laughs> Are you hungry? You know, that's why I love talking about our people. I love talking about our people because we're interesting. We're fun. We're human, and we tell our stories, and like when I tell them, there is no pain in the barrio, it's only when you leave the barrio. I wanna tell them that our stories are so rich and so defining, and they're not seen on television. And that's the thing I work on the most, to give people opportunities. Latino Logs has hired maybe over 350 actors, and right now I do a thing called Latino Thought Makers where I meet with Danny Trejo, Edward James Olmos, all these people who are friends who I admire. Because I wanna show one thing to the public is this, Latinos are the solution, they are never the problem. I mean that, I truly do. We make everything better. We're like the salsa on the food. Salsa is the number one condiment in the United States, we beat ketchup, we're the salsa. We'll give you a business flavor We'll give your school flavor. We'll bring all this world into it because if you want to be a Latino, you can join us easily. We accept you. You know, a lot of people don't know this. My wife is Anglo. She's Anglo. My kids are Mexicans. They're half Mexican, half Anglo. And what I love about that is I met her at a Mexican organization she was the board of. I assumed she was Latina. Her last name's Albin, you know, Susie Albin. I'm like, oh, she must be Spanish, she's blonde. And so, or Argentinian, or something. So I get involved with her, we of course get married, we have children, and I look at my kids, they speak perfect Spanish, much better than I. I send them to a Spanish immersion school. Spanish immersion school is like this, it's like uh, agua, agua, it's like waterboarding, it's like agua, agua. <laughs> agua. <laughs> For some reason they don't appreciate it, I don't know why. But I sent them to that school because I wanted them to have the language I didn't have. The language that was at my time growing up was not encouraged to speak. They didn't encourage this generation to speak Spanish. They would get in trouble for speaking Spanish or somehow ostracized. But you know what's something? The kid that lived up the street spoke Spanish. The kid in the, the chicken ranch spoke Spanish. And to end this story, I'll tell you this. That kid is Congressman Juan Vargas. The Latina up the street is the first Mexican-American astronaut, Elaine Ochoa. <laughs> a congressman, an astronaut, and a writer, all growing up within miles of each other, all in La Mesa, all coming from different parts of their life, all together. 
And I saw her recently, Elena Choa, speaking at, uh, I think it was National Council at Arasa, and she was there. And she sat next to me and she goes, Rick, Rick. I said, hello, I'm Rick Nakata. Yes, yes, I know, Rick, it's me. It's me, Elena, the astronaut. <laughs> And I said, she's been in space way too long. <laughs> I'm a little concerned right now. She's limited for, and she goes, in space too long? And she goes, oh, it's Ty Ochoa's sister. And I go, Ty, the guy in junior theater with me? Yeah, I'm his sister. I go, you're the nerdy one always learning about physics and stuff like that? <laughs> yes. I go, oh my god, Elena, and give her a big hug. And I remembered, at that point, I didn't know my history. I didn't see what was around me. And that's what we have to do. We have to see what's around us. We have to realize the opportunities that may come up from you being at this very event. And these students are getting scholarships. I want a scholarship. <laughs> I didn't get one this year. Unfortunately, I make too much. I want a scholarship. I look at that and I go, there's opportunities. The people you're going to meet today, the people you're going to talk to, you don't know what miracle there is. The person you're gonna meet in your life that can change your life and the ways you can change everyone's life. And without Mexicans and Latinos and Puerto Ricans and all our people in this country, this country would not be as great as it is. Because, we, yes. So when they say, make America great, we're doing just that. Our presence is making this country greater. And when I think of my uncle who died in World War II, and my father who served in Vietnam in World War II, and I think of all our families, and I think of Juan Vargas, and I think of this community, and I think of our stories, and I want to tell them. And I want you to tell your story. I want you to live your life. I want you to live the best life you can because you deserve it. Thank you so much. Rick, thank you very, very much. It really does make you think, huh? I know I have a story. He reminds us each one of us has a story, right? And how about that? That's powerful. You get to go to school. You get to go to college. Not that you have to. Think about that. Thank you very much, Rick. So next, I'd like to introduce to you uh, uh, my co-chair, who shares not only the Latino Caucus uh, efforts, but also the foundation. Uh, he's a young senator. And I have to tell you a little bit about what's happening um, with new membership coming in. So we, we've often talked, and you might have seen this on Facebook, that we have what we refer to as the Fabulous Five. There are uh, five members that came in uh, new to our uh, uh, to our, I would call it our team, our caucus, and all young and uh, mostly women, Latinas, yes. And so Omar, although he came in maybe a year or two before, I mean, he also contributes to that, I call it fresh, new, innovative thinking, and I am as one of our, I have to say it, senior members, <laughs> Iris, um, I have to say it's very, it's, it is um, inspiring and it brings so much hope to what our future is going to look like. Omar, come and give them a little bit about what you're about. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning. Um, so I am, my purpose up here is to kind of give you the lay of the land for today of what, what we're offering. But as I see 
and Ron Perlman, forgive me, um, I have a few minutes, so I'm going to take some, I'm going to go off script for a little bit, because um, Mr. Najera in his speech reminded me of um, a few things. Um, estamos entre familia, and this is a beautiful thing. I wish you all could see what I can see right now, and it's a room filled with Latinos que estamos diciendo que estamos presente. We are here in the state of Illinois, the caucus and our foundation. I am so blessed and proud to work with so many great leaders. Um, my my co-chair leader, Lisa Hernandez, uh, my leader in the Senate, uh, Iris Martinez. I truly, myself and the Fab Five, uh, the younger folks that have recently got into the, into the General Assembly, uh, we stand on the shoulder of giants, and there are some giants that are still with us, that if it wasn't for them paving the way for people like uh, Senator Miguel Del Valle, Willy Delgado, and so many others who have uh, Tony Berrios and others, um, we wouldn't have the opportunities that we've had. And um, this foundation has, has had this, um, conference historically because we wanted a way to give back to our communities and especially to our students so that they can seize that opportunity that a financial burden wouldn't be the reason that they felt that they couldn't achieve great things and get an education and go back to our communities to, to El Barrio and, 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 and be the great people and visionaries and leaders and astronauts and, 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 and doctors and teachers and nurses that, um, that they could be. And so um, I thought of um, where I come from, and excuse me, um, I think of my family and, and your story, Rick. I come from this little dot of an island in the globe called Puerto Rico. Que I wasn't born there, pero como dice la canción y, y, y la poema, que aunque si hubiera nacido en la luna, I would be Boricua, my, you know, because it's in my heart. I come from a family of, of, of uh, from a very rural area in Puerto Rico, in San Sebastián y Quebradillas, um, on the northwestern end of the island, very sort of far from San Juan and the metropolitan life, um, from a very rural community where if you combine my grandparents' education, maybe they got up to all four of them to maybe a third grade education. Their children left La Isla de Encanto. You don't leave the island of enchantment because you choose to. You leave because you're looking to improve your life and that of the future of your family. You don't leave Mexico and Latin America, those beautiful places out of a choice because you wanna go the United States, you go to the United States because there's something here, there's a dream, there's something that's offered here that if you work hard, you should be able to achieve. That is the point of this conference. That is the point of the work that we do as a foundation and what we fight for as a caucus. is to decide, estamos presente, we have 18% of the state, and you are not gonna ignore us. I have the privilege of being this young guy from Humble Park who's Puerto Rican that, that, that married a beautiful Mexican lady so that, that interplay of, uh, Rick, what you're saying, Humble Park, it's true, you have Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. In my home, you have both. Um, a beautiful lady who I have to give a shout out and I apologize, but uh, you know, you said about getting an education, my wife, I'm, I'm, the one thing that I, I jokingly say, and I, I'm serious about this, I fear that she decides to get into politics and run against me, because I, I would even vote for her. La, la doctora uh, Elizabeth Aquino, who's over there with her, her nurses. But we're here to learn. We're here to, to, to estar entre familia and have a discussion. We're here to celebrate what we've done in the last session. We've, we, there was a lot of historic things. And many of the things, and, I, and I'm so proud of people say, like, what Latino caucus, what, was, what were you excited about, what not? It's that at, we were at the table for every single piece of legislation that I would say that had an important role 
in, 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 in what we, we did this year. The, Rep the Reproductive Health Act was revived because two of our Latinas at their home gathered Lati uh, Latinas and, and, and the Women's Caucus together to say, we are gonna make decisions on our bodies, not anybody else. <laughs> two Latinas and more that fought for that. We were there in terms of the, the Recreational Cannabis Act, in terms of uh, our budget, which budgeted more money per capita than any other uh, state for the census. We were there for the capital bill that put in $45 billion. We were at the table so that we would not be on the menu. And so I'm gonna go back on to uh, on script right now for the last few minutes. And I wanna inform you of all the things that we do have for today, okay? So, um, as, your, as the co-chair of the Latino Caucus, I want to extend a warm welcome to you all to our annual event. As uh, you will see and discover today, we work diligently to provide timely information and resources to help us continue and realize the purpose of our foundation. I want to give an overview of the day immediately following this opening session. You can choose from two extremely imp uh, informative and important panel uh, presentations. In the Mallard Room, which is directly behind the ballroom, a panel of deputy governors will discuss access, accountability, and opportunity through each uh, state agency for which they are responsible for. We, um, have also, we also have the chief of staff of our great governor, uh, J.B. Prisker, with us today, and she's going to also be a part of that uh, discussion, which is really exciting. Uh, also, during that time in the Monarch Room, uh, which is in front of the ballroom, we will hear from a panel of experts who will discuss issues related to the 2020 census, which is very important, and then subsequently the 2021 redistricting, both of which are vital, uh, of a vital importance to our community and, and the future of our community. At noon, we will enjoy our scholarship luncheon, as we always do, honoring 25 outstanding college students. Uh, we are pleased that this year uh, to have Stacey Baca from ABC 7 uh, Chicago as our Master of Ceremonies. And we are extremely honored that our, our congressman, because it's the only Latino congressman that we have, uh, um, uh, hopefully that changed with, with the census and redistricting, but our congressman, Chuy Garcia, is going to be with us today, uh, today at our luncheon to give um, some, a few words. Uh, and at the end of the luncheon, please take the opportunity to meet our Legislative Latino Caucus uh, members for a casual conversation and coffee. Um, we changed this, uh, uh, this, is, this is a little new this year. We usually had sort of like a town hall where we all sat together. We wanted to get away from that and actually be able to interact with, with you all. So tenemos cafe, little coffee mugs over there. But in order to get your coffee mug, you can get coffee in, a, in something else, but to get the coffee mug and to get coffee in that, and uh, we ask you to, to get onto social media. I see a few people already with their, their phones up. Uh, we're asking you all to post something in terms of this conference. Uh, the hashtag is uh, hashtag ILCF2019. That stands for the Illinois Latino Legislative Caucus Foundation 2019. So again, hashtag ILLCF2019. In addition to that, um, there's a reception that follows the coffee and conversation and, and the caucus, and we in, in that reception, everyone is also invited to. And lastly, another addition that we have this year is that we have a resource central rooms, which are open throughout the conference. There are three rooms that have uh, specific topics. Um, in ballroom I, we have a room specifically designated towards immigration. In, the, um, in ballroom J, we have a, a, um, a, a room focused on the U.S. Census, on the upcoming 2020 Census. And lastly, lastly in ballroom J, we have a, uh, excuse me, in Cardinal Room, we have the uh, recreational cannabis conversation, especially those entrepreneurs that are interested in what the bill did and how you can get involved and things like that. We, we have some experts um, that are there. I encourage you to, to, to be involved, to, to choose, um, you know, to, to visit also those tables outside. Um, and lastly, again, I, I appreciate you all being here. Let's interact with each other. Let's get to meet new people. Let's say hi to old friends. But remember that there is a purpose to this. We are here to, to, to let the entire state of Illinois know 
that the Latino community estamos presente y, y estamos entre familia, familia hoy. So, love you guys. Enjoy the day. Uh, you have about 15 minutes before you choose your other uh, thing. Thank you so much. <laughs>